Hello, good morning. Welcome to the Sunday Supplement. Coming up on today's show, Harry Kane, he sets his sights on Wayne Rooney's goal-scoring record as England put four past Bulgaria. Off the field, two England legends, they're at each other's throats. Michael Owen continues his attack on Alan Shearer. And Watford, they're the first to make a change in the Premier League. Javi Grazia is sacked. 31 minutes later, Kike Sanchez Flores returned to Vicarage Road. Stirring up the Hornets' nest today, Matt Dickinson is Chief Sports Writer at The Times. Jeremy Cross is Chief Sports Writer at The Daily Star. Rob Draper is Chief Football Writer with The Mail on Sunday. Morning, chaps. Good to see you. Thanks for coming on. I know we're all at Wembley. Yesterday, we'll talk about that game in England's 4-0 victory against Bulgaria in a few moments' time. Don't forget, you can tweet the show at Sunday Sup. The best will appear on your screen over the next 90 minutes. Let's have a look what's making the back pages of the papers then this morning. We'll start with the sun. Uh, it's treble and strife. Good news for England on the pitch at Wembley yesterday. Not so good uh, for their batsman up at Old Trafford. We're here to talk about the football, of course, and Harry Kane's hat-trick, which we're coming straight on to this morning in part one of today's programme, the Sunday Mirror. Harry's, Harry is having a ball. Raheem Sterling, of course, on the score sheet as well yesterday for England in that 4-0 victory. The Sunday people here. Uh, Bullseye is the back page uh, lead in the Sunday People, but they also talk about Virgil van Dijk. He's got a new contract at Liverpool. Neil Moxie with that story uh, this morning, deserving of it as well after the season that he has just had. The Sunday Times proving that newspapers are alive and kicking. They can get stories too. Kiki Sanchez Flores is back at Watford uh, after Javi Grazia was sacked yesterday. Jonathan Northcroft was first onto that news yesterday, af yesterday afternoon during the England game. The Observer abuse Lukaku. We'll talk about Lukaku in part two of today's programme. He's the latest victim of the ultra's warped mentality. That's a special report in The Observer this morning and Ollie Holt's column in the mail on Sunday. We'll get on to this in part three. It's uh, in talking uh, about uh, Keane and uh, Alan Shearer. Uh, Owen, Michael Owen and Roy Keane are fighting battles they are never going to win. We'll talk about those respective wars uh, in part three of today's programme. First up, though, we'll talk about England's <coughs> performance at Wembley. Um, Harry Kane's hat-trick, got another goal for Raheem Sterling. What was the highlight of the, uh, of the performance for you, Matt? Um, well, I think yeah, against, let's say, first up, yeah. pretty average um, opponents, average. which is probably being kind. Um, it's, it's job done, and it's, you know, there are plenty of positives. You have to look at, obviously... Uh, Scoring a hat trick in any international game isn't isn't to be taken for granted. I think Raheem Sterling, um, plenty of life from him. I think you know I, I would have liked to have seen a slightly different midfield balance. Um, I just think in a game where you're going to dominate with that much possession, having Rice and Henderson, I, you know I'm I'm really keen to see, and certainly Gareth Southgate's talked about seeing what Winks can do in one in in that midfield, especially yep. in a game when you're going to dominate the ball like that. I'd like to see a bit more of that. But we saw Mason Mount came on for a debut. An awful lot of positives. I mean, the you know, in say in a game that uh, that they're dominating, they're, we're seeing a pattern with England. We're seeing create plenty of chances, take chances, um, but as we know, this was not Holland, Germany, or yeah. France, or you know, someone decent to see the defence up against, or to see Declan Rice have to chase a, a brilliant number ten around. Mm. But we like what we see at Wembley these days with England in qualifying. You said this morning when summer returns to Wembley Stadium, we'll have our answer. We're talking about next summer. Mm -hmm. Are we on the verge of witnessing uh, something historic? And you're talking about, of course, Euro 2020. Are you seeing signs um, with this England team in terms of the direction of travel under Gareth Southgate that they can do something special next summer? I'm seeing signs that they, they deserve to be considered amongst the contenders. I don't think they're the best side in Europe and I, I'd probably still go for Belgium and that and... You know, plenty. Gareth listed about seven, didn't he, yesterday? Yeah. Playing his cards close to his chest, but but I, you know, it deserves to be talked about as one of the best three or four teams in Europe. I, I wouldn't swap England's attack with. I might swap it with Portugal's, you know. But there's not many countries I'd want to swap that attack mm. for, um, particularly given you have got Sancho and Hudson Odoi to come in. You know, Sancho off the bench yesterday, Hudson Odoi to come back from injury. Obviously, you do worry the midfield might get scored. We, we, know, we only find out every two years whether the midfield's good enough, because in these games, of course they're good enough. They're much better than most of the sides they play. We won't find out until we're in a quarter-final or a semi-final, hopefully, um, and you're up against Portugal or Spain and they're keeping the ball and, you know, maybe we're not. It's what happened against Croatia. So, but, but they're in there with a fighting chance. I would be cautiously say that I'd be disappointed if they didn't make the semis. And I think that, you know, from there on in, the, 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 the managers always talk about the small margins that 
those levels. Um, but a semi-final at Wembley should obviously be the goal and would be exciting. Mm. Can we talk about Harry Kane's week? Because the Emirates uh, last Sunday, um, and I, I don't know if we all share this opinion on, on the table, but I, I felt he was looking for that penalty. It wasn't given, of course, but I felt he was looking for a penalty. Um, uh, uh, that was his last club game, of course, uh, last Sunday in the 2-2 draw between Arsenal and Tottenham. And then he walks out onto Wembley yesterday and he has the confidence, that swagger, not arrogance, but swagger, complete conviction. Every time, he's, every time he gets an opportunity to score, he has complete conviction and confidence and he backs himself that he will do it. Yeah, and it was interesting when the um, when Rashford won that penalty. He, um, I said to the guy next to me in the press box, I "Wonder if he'll take this penalty." I don't know why he even thought it would be anyone else but Kane. But Rashford, Rashford didn't, Rashford didn't even <laughs> look at Kane. But you know, it's a totally contrasting situation what he's got at Man United with Rashford and um, and Pogba and all that palaver. But um, yeah, look, he um, he never. He never looks like he's going to miss from the penalty spot, does he? He's, I think he scored 12 in 12 the day before in training. And um, I mean, when you think about how long it took Rooney to break um, Sir Bobby Charlton's goal scoring record, I mean, he's halfway there nearly already. And that stood for nearly 50 years, that record. And it mm. looks like Kane's going to break that. I mean, he could break that in another two or three years. He's that good. Um, so yeah, you 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 know you are get almost guaranteed to get goals from Kane, and that is a precious commodity in international football. I yeah. think he's also he's also in, in changed and I think still improving as a player. Isn't he? I mean, we've seen you know this dropping deep, and I mean he he doesn't some of his is the way he drops and spins and and puts you know that's why the system works because you've got Sterling and Rashford who are capable of running through the middle. Sterling's finishing is obviously over the last couple of years just you know improved massively. You can see him couple of times yesterday throwing his arms up because he was in great positions for cutbacks and they weren't quite mm -hmm. coming to him. Cutbacks that probably at Man City. He's, he's also a very he's, good he's passer of the to. ball, isn't he, Kane? He's one Kane, of the well, best exactly. And Kane's become, you know, it's interesting you can compare with, I mean, Wayne Rooney obviously was important for England all the way through, but actually his international peak came pretty pretty yeah, early. Yeah. But yep. Kane, Kane is showing sort of healthy signs of longevity in, in the way his game has expanded. He did die at Arsenal, yeah. But yeah, he did. And answer your original question. But uh, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not absolutely... Did he, did he not, dive? Yeah, but I'm not... Well, he looked for the penalty. I wouldn't say it's a blatant dive. I'm not too bothered about that, as long as we acknowledge that England players do it. Yeah. But what I don't like is when we... If we give Harry heroic status and then sort of try and claim that foreigners dive, that, that, that's when it gets nasty for me. You expect a good centre-forward to be looking for a penalty. There was a very blatant dive from... A, uh, a Bulgarian player yesterday, which is the sort of thing that, that I do get a little bit upset about, but I don't get massively upset by diving as, as some people do. It's Your like paper my, does. My, well, well some, I, I don't share all the views of my newspaper. That, uh, <laughs> Any uh, others? Michael Owen, Michael Owen, you know, obviously, so when he against Pochettino um, got the penalty against Argentina, you know, he was looking for the penalty, as Pochettino will confirm. I mean, the, the England players have done this forever, and it's, it's as long as we don't make this a big thing about English players don't cheat and everyone else does, it's like, do you expect your centre forward to be looking for? Penalties. I, I don't have a massive issue with Harry Kane on that. I, he was trying to manipulate that scenario, wasn't he, basically, with yeah. his body. He yeah. admitted that afterwards. He was asked about it after the game last night. And he said, well, I was just trying to use my body to try and engineer a foul. I have more of an issue with a terrible tackle than yeah. a striker trying to show the referee that, you know, someone's backing into me. Mm. Um, Sunday Times this morning, David Walsh, he talks about England's front three. And he says, with Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo growing older, could one of them develop into the best player in the world? He's talking, of course, about England's front three here. Kane, Raheem Sterling, Rashford. Of the three of them, which is the most likely to take the crown of, of Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo as, as a world player of the year? Mm. Which of them could do it? Uh, Mbappe. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Sitting yeah, out France's uh, game yesterday, though. So I mean, yeah, I know, Rob, for England. Uh, yeah, there is a case to be said which front three is better. Yeah, they're in the conversation. But yeah, if you look at France, you know, Griezmann, Mbappe. I take uh, Arsenal forward over France. Much as I have much respect for Olivier Giroud, I'd take Kane over Giroud, wouldn't you? So. Yeah, but then they've got Debele and other options. Yeah, they might other, play uh, Mbappe other over number nine other, or what, other yeah. options. Yeah, but, you know, when you've got. When you're starting with Mbappe and Griezmann, then, you know, you're. Uh, you know, those two would walk into pretty much any team in the world, I think. So, I think, you know, I mean, Sterling, Sterling's improvement over the last, 
under Pep Guardiola has been fantastic. I mean, he's looking like a, you know, a senior superstar international footballer, isn't he? Um, the one issue with Sterling when he first joined City was he wasn't he wasn't a good enough finisher. He didn't score enough goals. He was a great creator of goals. Um, but you can't point that finger at him. And also, he looked, you know, there were, you, sometimes when he looked, you know, get in the box and, he, and you see yeah. him tense up. Whereas, as yeah. I say, yesterday it was really notable. There were mm. two or three times when he was, uh, yeah, he screamed at Rose once, I think there was one at Rashford once. And it was, there were he three times the I noticed where he is screaming at a player, I could have, you know, I was in there, I was in yeah. there. And he's got this hunger and this confidence now that if you tee me up, I'm going to finish, which <laughs> is a massive transformation mentally as much as, you know, in, in the way he played. And Southgate said that after, didn't he, that he's now hungry, hungry to score. To me, Sterling was a big plus point. I know it sounds silly when Kane scored a hat-trick, but seven in seven, seven goals in seven games, warmly applauded when he came off. It feels like he's, he's embraced as an England player now, as he should be, but it's, it's the goals, it's the delivery that people are now seeing, which is allowing a wider public to go, OK, yeah, he is a top class. But I actually, I don't think any of them will end up being the best player in the world. I think Kane's the best at what he does, which is hard-working, centre-forward finishing. Because, uh, you know, I think, but I was going to say, Sterling probably would be, or, or probably someone like Sancho if he develops, you know, because they've got that explosive, creative energy, they can do something different, you know, which, which is what we've seen from Messi and Ronaldo over the last 10, 11 years, which is why Mbappe is, is the obvious sort of heir to that throne, isn't he? And, and there are, there's, it's players like that or your Dembele's. But, you know, hey, I mean, Sancho's you know, one of the best young players in the world, isn't he? And, you know, we don't quite know how he's going to develop, but oh, and I wouldn't want to put that on him. But I think you need that little bit extra whereby you just completely bewitch a player you just don't know you can't play against them that the, obviously the the best player the, the the very best players like Messi and Ronaldo have. Mm. I think we saw yesterday why Kane is the main man up front for England but Marcus Rashford you see a lot of him with Manchester United um, yeah. is, is he in danger of it, here of going through a career where no one knows what his best position is or where he wants to play or where he is meant to play or where he should play? Yeah I mean he, he, so he came through at United's through the ranks as a number nine scored a lot of goals um, but under several managers, he has sort of become pigeonholed in this wide position, um, and that's what is where he plays with England now. I mean, he is unfortunate in the in terms of England that Kane is such a good number nine. And Southgate said yesterday that um, you know um, they've always looked at Rashford as a alternative number nine, but he plays so much out wide for United that he's caught between two stools really. Um, and I think Rashford, when United sold um, Lukaku this summer to Inter Milan, he was pretty certain he would get a, a good crack at being United's number nine this season. And um, up until he got injured um, a couple of weeks ago, Martial was playing number nine. So it's a thorny issue, that, because he... I'm sure he would be a great number nine, but he, he's also very dangerous with his pace out wide, so... I don't think he's, he's not. He's not unless Kane gets injured, which heaven forbid that never happens. But, but let's, let's say Kane was. Yeah. Kane, let's say Kane was injured because, it, or the or suspended for whatever reason, can't play. Where does, does Gareth Southgate play? Rashford number nine. Does he play? Um, he's Sterling. Sterling nine. I'd, I'd, I mean, I'd want to do it in a friendly first. Callum Wilson. I'd, you know, yeah, I'd, I'd probably play Sterling and play Rashford and Sancho or Hudson Odoi and Sancho. You know, I'd, I'd like to see that. I, I wouldn't. I think if Rashford wants to be number nine, he's going to have to weigh in with 25 goals this season, isn't he? He's going to have to have that kind of season, the one that Harry Kane had when he, he announced himself. But he's going so, to struggle to get that many from out wide, isn't he? Well, exactly, yeah. Especially so, in the United side. The other yeah. issue he's got is he's playing in a, a pretty average. United okay, well, if, he, if he's playing wide, then he's got to get close to 20 goals, hasn't yeah. he? So, and, and until he does that, I don't think he gets. The, I mean, he, he will fill in at times for Kane, but I don't think he can expect to be the. England number nine until he's goal scoring and, and, and he's a fantastic player. And the pace he showed, you know, he killed that, that the, the right sided uh, mm -hmm. centre half for, for Bulgaria yesterday. I mean, just, just ran past him. So that's not to denigrate him. He has some wonderful things to offer. But if he wants that top job, he's going to have to be more clinical. There's a huge burden on him at United this season because obviously they've, they've let Lukaku go. And for, while Lukaku d divided opinion, he did get you quite a lot of goals. Yeah. And they've not replaced Lukaku. So it, it, a lot of that responsibility now falls on Rashford's shoulders and you can forget that he's still only 21 and he's been around for so long, you, you forget how he's still really young and pretty inexperienced, really. Mm -hmm. And um, the pressure is on him to get, like Rob said, at least 20 goals this season. 
United are such an average side who are battling to just get in the top four, let alone to challenge for the title. I mean, they're already out of the title race, really, when you look at the table. I know that sounds crazy to say that just at the start of September, but so it's going to be a tough no, season really. for Rashford, <laughs> and he almost looks like one of those players who looks relieved to go with England because he knows he's joining a good side that are going to be well drilled and winning. And it was always the other way around. It? Players used to used to dread going to England uh, camps, but Rashford looks like he enjoys it's a, it. It's a release from the. The strains is under it. And the know. pressure at Manchester United. Just want to have a, a quick word on the defence as well, as well mm. Matt, because I feel sorry for them on days like this, because they scan when they scan newspapers and websites for their, uh, their marks out of ten, uh, they'll see they all got sixes this morning, apart from uh, Jordan Pickford, who got a seven. But what, what are they meant to do when they're just standing on the halfway line without a great, without a great deal to do in a, in a game? They weren't, it's not as though they were tested yesterday. A couple of, I mean, couple a couple of, of early games. chances, yeah. okay. weren't there? A couple of counter-attacks. But that's but, it. Yeah, but that was it. I mean... That, well, exactly, and, and that's why we were saying, you know, you have to temper the excitement and the progress with, you know, let's see us against a team that's, that's dominating the ball or coming at us. Or, so I think that's, you know, I, I think obviously Maguire is now absolutely fixed in that. We've still maybe got Gomez, I think Gomez, if fit and playing regularly for Liverpool, to me is, is probably definitely That would be that your team. first choice pairing with Stones. Well, I think... I think I'd prefer to see. I mean, I, you know, I'd prefer to see Trent Alexander-Arnold, um, as I think he just offers so much more. Um, I think he offers more attacking threat than, than Trippier, and certainly his, his dead balls are, f are fantastic. So there's at least there are options there as well. Um, mm -hmm. But we do need to see them tested. I think we saw those were the second choice fullbacks, though, weren't they? I yeah. think yeah. And, and first choice fullbacks will be playing on Tuesday because I think he made it clear that he regards Tuesday's game as a much bigger challenge. Yeah. And I think he got the, the reserve fullbacks yesterday. Mm. The issue for England isn't it up top or at the back, it's in the middle of the park. Yeah. Who, who is going to be that creative and dominant midfielder for the next decade? Obviously, Mount's coming through now. There are options. And, Ro and there's, there's Ross Barkley, Ruben Loftus cheek injured, I accept that. Um, you mentioned Mason Mount. There there's are a lot of Winks. There's a lot, I think there's a lot. I, I, is Winks the I creator? Fear, no, no, well, sorry, I meant the sort of dominant, I meant the creator. Sorry, I thought you were referring to the sort of, you know, the holding, sort of creating. Type, you mean like the attacking creative yeah, number eight, number to, ten? Who's okay, going to fine. unlock yeah. that defence against a side like Germany or France? Or why can't you do what Liverpool do? Just give it to the front three. Yeah, I'm, win yeah. the ball, give it to those three, and let them sort it out. So, the, so that was my. I'm more worried about the holding midfield and the run around that the Modric Shapiro is going to give us. So I, mm. I, I can live, you know, because I think you know your Hendersons, your Mounts, your Barclays. You know, nice. they, they may not be the most creative players in, in the world, but the, the, what they've got in front of them, they can play a good pass to the guys in front of them. I'm worried that we lose possession and then we're just scurrying around, as we often do in the top games, in the semi-finals or the quarter-finals, where we used to get to. Um, that, that would be my worry, which is why I said there's a lot riding on Winks, and I think it's a little bit too much on young shoulders at the moment. But we, we need a player who can dictate, in the way that Skulls used to when he went deep, can just dictate the pace of a game from that deep line position and, and that, that's where my fear is for the weakness of the side rather than the creative side in midfield because I think you can do the Liverpool thing quite effectively. Sure. Good win, Good win for England though yesterday, 4-0 against Bulgaria at uh, Wembley Stadium. And what better time uh, to sack a Premier League manager than during an England international because that's what Watford did yesterday when they sacked Javi Grazia. More on him next. Welcome back. What a news hound uh, Jonathan Northcroft is. He had the story yesterday during the England game that uh, Javi Grazia was about to be fired by Watford and that Kiki Sanchez uh, Flores the, making a surprise return to Vicarage Road as the manager. Uh, the Mail on Sunday here, Rob, your paper, of course, uh, says that 820, that's the number of games that uh, Graham Taylor managed Watford for. It's more games than the 12 managers since Malkin Mackay in 2008 Combined, so every manager since Malcolm McCarthy, that Graham Taylor on his own managed eight hundred. Yeah, but rel so. relatively speaking, Harry Grazia is surely due a statue under the Pottsy regime at Watford, isn't he? I mean, to go two seasons is unheard of. <laughs> I mean, that that is a great service. I imagine there'll be specials in the Watford Observer for the long service he's had. Um, it's just what Watford do, isn't it? And and I don't look. I was born in Watford. I went to school in Watford. A lot of my friends, or some of my best friends, are Watford fans. Um, and um, you know, I've grew up with the club. And I don't particularly like the slightly clinical method of management they have now, but it works. And they've got to a FA Cup final. 
they're solid in the Premier League, obviously not made a solid start, which is why they're making the change. Um, and a lot of Watford fans were, are, are very, very happy with that and will tell you that they're very happy with that. I know a few others who, who yearn for the sort of more homely days of Graham Taylor where you felt like you were building a, a community club rooted with local players and all the rest of it. But, you know, it's, they, they've got a model. Liken it to Chelsea, you know, over the last 15 years. If, it's go, not, if, it's, if they feel it's going stale, they'll change it and they'll bring someone in, and that works for them. And Chelsea have done much the same, kept winning cups, you know, changed the manager plenty of times. So I'm loath to criticise them because, you know, I think I know, Harry Grassier knew what he was getting into. It's ironic that in the summer he's been talked up for some big jobs in Chelsea, you know, and he is obviously a, a good coach, but, you know, it, you know they feel he's obviously... They've, they, they've been struggling for a while. We're just talking about the sort of end of last season and the beginning of this season. And, and I'm loath to say this, but, but it does feel like the FA Cup final almost killed them. That distraction, more than a distraction, is it's a big day out, something you remember for a lifetime. And I, and I hate that feeling that the FA Cup can be a mere distraction, but it, it does feel like that's sort of lost their momentum, doesn't it? Mm. It was a brutal um, game, 6-0 against Manchester City. Mm. Would would there have been a hangover from that from that the way that the manner that You'd Manchester like to City think went not. about I mean, the FA Cup final? They've had a, a summer to think about who they want as their manager. I mean, what's bizarre is how have they had four games, three mm -hmm. games? Drew at Newcastle. His last game was the draw at Newcastle. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. So it, it just seems bizarre how you can change a manager after such a brief spell of a new season. Palace. If they've you know, seen issues over the summer. Which you allude to, then why not make a change then? Why not? Why not make a managerial change then? For, do you, it appears like they've said almost said to him, "Right, well, you've got four games, mate, to see what you can do and see if you can rescue this and turn things around." Mm. Well, that's the nature of the game these days, isn't it? I mean, Pal I think Palace did it with Frank. I mean, okay, this was a new manager, but Palace did it with Frank de Boer. I think after four games, yeah. four successive defeats, make the change. It's, it's ruthless, but it says we need to change this. This mm. isn't right. But that was that was going drastically wrong at Palace from from the off, wasn't mm. it? You could, yeah. At least Watford have got a point. The ironic thing is, you could actually see that the, that was probably the right thing to do. There's an argument to say, look, he, did he deserve longer because he got them to the cup final? I mean, there's, pff, although they got they got they got an absolute hammering from a, a remarkable City side, it was still a great achievement. They finished 11th. But I think they like Rob alluded to the the problems started as soon as they got to the cup final. That's all the players were focused on, and they, they were. You could see they were tailing off. They finished eleventh. Yeah, shame they weren't focused when they got to the final. I think they're not bad. You know, it doesn't suddenly make him a bad manager, does it? Yeah. That's the crucial thing. You can imagine any ex-Watford manager can goes into his next interview saying, you know, I was sat by Watford, and you'd imagine they say, oh, well, we'll sort of we'll part of that to the side because that, that's that's what Watford do. You know, it's it doesn't suddenly. This is a reign that was, as you say, at worst going a bit stale, but it's not suddenly as if. Javi Garcia doesn't know how to, to manage. I mean, it's interesting as well, Rob's saying about how, you know, it's, it's, there is a sort of cold feel to it. And Kika Sanchez Flores actually <laughs> talked about that when he left. I mean, he was, you know, yeah. he was doing, he had the mid table, he reached the semi final of the FA Cup. And it was obvious for weeks before it happened that he was, he was going. And he said then, you know, I like to play, I like to see the game as a bit more romantic and, and sort of building something. This lot are cold and clinical and see the game differently. They'll and, never work again at Watford. And, yeah, and you thought, you know, it, you know, and but he, you know, there was he was liked by a lot of people, wasn't he? Because he has, mm. you know, he yeah. has he has a, a good way about him. I mean, he'd done a, a pretty decent job. But anyway, it shows how well it That's reinforces how cold and clinical they are. That they actually, even though they had a disagreement, they're like, look, you can do a job for us, and it might, for all we know. Would probably be a job for six nine months. But it know, must be a job for six nine see. months because the reason why Kiki Sanchez Flores went was they, you remember, the people at the board said at the time where they felt it tailed off, it had gone a bit stale. You know, after a, they had a very good start from memory, um, and that's that's a bit that puzzles me. So they've, they've gone, we're going back to the reason they come back to Yukanovich next, don't they? and they can go through them all again. I mean, mm. you know, they've they've all done fairly decent jobs there. No one's done, a, no one's had done a terrible job. But they've all basically had a season and said, right, now we're freshening up again. Garcia signed a long-term contract, <laughs> yeah. four-and-a-half-year contract in November. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. less than a year later. I mean, this makes a mockery when, when you see these managers sign long, or players even, really, yeah. sign these long contracts. They don't necessarily mean a great deal. That means he's got a nice payoff, doesn't Yeah, exactly. It? Yeah. Is that the life of a Premier League manager, though, in, in mid-table? You said Watford, they did finish 11th last season. That It's, it's all short. You're taking a job 
with the chief executive sat in front of you saying, you're here for the long term, knowing full well, actually you're not. You're four games, five games in, they'll change it. Yeah, managers aren't stupid. They, they will see and hear these things. But, I mean, you know, look at David Moyes. He signed a contract for seven years. Still at, running, isn't it? They just <laughs> run out in the summer. <laughs> the, for, just literally just finished paying David Moyes, yeah. And he lasted ten months. Um, yeah, because if you don't succeed relatively quickly, you are, you are basically swimming against the tide, and that's just the nature of the beast these days. But it does depend on the model. It's not, not that way at Burnley and Bournemouth, is it? I mean, Burnley have had some, re had some real scrapes over the last couple of seasons, but they wouldn't sack Sean Dyche, would they? Because they know ultimately he's going to come good. And mm -hmm. It just depends on your, your ownership model. So have we got any sympathy for, for Grazia and the, and the situation? OK, no one likes to see a man lose his job, but are we, are we in agreement that, well, yeah. they, they were going to make... The, you lose games... You lose games in the manner that Watford are losing them. They change the manager, that's the deal. Plenty of sympathy for Kratz here, and I'm sure he'll get a very good job, or a you know, pretty good job, pretty soon. Yeah. OK, um, let's move on. We're going to talk another uh, issue, which is uh, pretty serious stuff. Special report here in The Observer. It's about Romelu Lukaku. Um, abuse Lukaku, Matt. He's the latest victim of the, victim of the ultras' warped... Uh, loyalty. This is about the racial abuse that uh, Lukaku um, suffered on his Inter Milan uh, debut. There was uh, an explanation of sorts um, in the week from the from the ultras. Um, I, I'm not sure many people um, agree with it, but um, Lukaku said, "Ladies and gentlemen, it's 2019." In, in in words that actually Marcus Rashford used on Friday at an England press conference, um, we should we, instead of going forward, we're actually going backwards. Yeah. So I mean, he gets he gets abused. Um, playing the calorie and then the, the into into his own fans mm. come out with a statement saying, you know, don't take it personally. It's it's our it's, a compliment. Uh, it's our it's our cultural way of, of giving you a compliment um, to be abused this way, which yeah. is is about as warped logic uh, <laughs> as you could get. I mean, it you know we can hardly be complacent in this country, but you know Italy has you know had pretty big flare-ups uh, in this problem over a, a long time and. You know, it's clear not enough is close to being done. I mean, it's a bigger, deeper cultural issue than just than just football. But fo when it comes to football, football has to be seen to be more than doing its bit. And um, you know, it's reached that point where there should be. Uh, I mean, it doesn't eradicate the racism, but it at least shows that it won't be tolerated when there should be stadium closures. There should be. You know, I mean, I, I don't know how you deal with the Inter fans themselves, but we need to look at what measure they can. I mean, they need to players need to be sorted, supported yeah. if they're walking off pitches or whatever they think is is appropriate. Mm. The statement from the uh, group of um, Inter Milan fans who occupy the second tier of the Curva Nord. This is Nicky Baldini writing in the Observer this morning, saying you have to understand that Italy is not like many other North European countries where racism is a real problem. Um, in Italy, we use ways. Um, to help our teams um, and try to make our opponents nervous, not for racism, but to mess things up. Try in an attempt to justify um, uh, the, the calories, um, the actions of the calorie supporters. Well, so, so it's, it's trying to justify it then, basically. Mm. Um, well, why do, there, are, there are numerous other ways you can try and put a player off or distract him. I mean, you don't, you don't have to be racist, do you? I mean, it's just like Matt said, it's just a warped logic that you'll never be able to grasp. And um, it's a problem. Every press conference we go, us guys go to now, you, it's so prevalent, this issue. We're either talking about an incident with one of our players or a player who now plays abroad like Lukaku does. And there doesn't seem to be a press conference that goes by without a, a question being raised or the issue of racism being raised. Rashford actually made a good point on um, Friday when he said, the more we talk about it, the less seems to happen in terms of change. And I appreciate football as a responsibility, but it goes far wider than football. It's just that football happens to be one of the most watched things on the planet and it brings it to the fore. But I mean, Gareth Southgate I, on Friday, he, he, he seems to suggest that well, Eng English football is so far advanced in terms of tackling racism that actually a lot of other countries um, are, are, are a long way behind English yeah. football. Paul Ince made a good point last week. He said, you get into the stage now where um, if a club supporters racially boos a player, authorities need to look at throwing them out of a competition or at least docking them a significant amount of points 
or encouraging teams to walk off the pitch. Mm. It sounds crazy, but it's a crazy situation, and we no one has got a solution yet, and it's something that could take years and years to address. But I think it, you're reaching a point where something drastic has to happen. And given it's her calorie or not, this is this was not a one-off there no, either. No, so no. I mean, it's it's clear not not nearly enough is being done. You know, you know, you've got pro particular problem clubs. Then they, you know, as you say, it, it's. At the very least, it needs to be uh, exemplary punishments need to be in place just mm. to, to, to show the intolerance of it. I, I always admire the way the players talk about it. Actually, I always think they confront. I always think they confront the issue in a very calm, methodical, and um, yeah, passionate but considered manner. I, Lukaku this week, for example, yeah. Rashford um, on Friday, uh, Raheem Sterling, Sterling before Sterling. that on a, on a number of occasions. There are, of course, lots of other current. Uh, footballers and their contemporaries, but I, I always admire. Actually, I always admire their approach. I do, and you, 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 you know, the, I agree. And obviously, Raheem Sterling taking the lead last year. I think that I, I know what Gareth Southgate's saying about us being far advanced, but I think there's a danger in that, in that it's it becomes like this near imperialist thing that oh look how much better we are. And of course, we all know the issues that are here. It's a point that John Barnes often makes is that that by it's easy to 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 look down on Italy and say well all the problems are there because it makes us feel like we, we don't have this issue mm -hmm. here and it, clearly we have had players racially abused last season um, from the crowds. I think the specific problem for Italy is, is as much to do with the um, tolerating the ultras, which the owners do. Um, and that, that's the issue. They won't, it comes from the ownership, we saw the statement from the ownership calorie, you know, and, and the, if Inter, I haven't seen the, the club have responded to it, so I might have missed it. But actually, the club should be taking on their own fans and saying that is not acceptable. But Italian clubs don't do that because no. the ultras have an awful lot of power. And so it comes from ownership, but as it comes from our political leaders, doesn't it? It comes from the culture of, of the, the day at the moment where racism seems to be tolerated and accepted now. Yeah, sure. OK. Uh, wise words. A uh, special report this morning written by uh, Nicky Baldini um, in The Observer. Well worth a read. OK, uh, next up... Well, it's gloves off, isn't it? It's Owen and Shearer coming next. Welcome back. Reminder of uh, who's with us this morning. Matt Dickinson from The Times, Jeremy Cross from The Star and uh, Rob Draper from The Mail on Sunday. Just remind you, let's just remind you what's in the papers this morning. Uh, the Sunday people um, reflecting on England's 4-0 victory over Bulgaria at Wembley yesterday. It's bullseye three goals for Harry Kane, another one for Raheem Sterling. Also this story, Neil Moxley says that uh, Virgil van Dijk um, is about to sign his new contract uh, with Liverpool. He deserves it after the season. He's had the back pages dominating, of course, uh, the red tops. So Harry's having a bull after that hat trick. He'll play against Kosovo, of course, on Tuesday night, Treble and Strife. That's the back page of uh, The Sun this morning, reflecting on uh, England's uh, dismal um, ashes uh, showing at Old Trafford yesterday. But uh, Harry Kane, the main man for England, on the pitch at Wembley with his hat trick. Jonathan Northcroft's story, Kiki Sanchez for his back at Watford. Harry Grazia sacked yesterday. Uh, the announcement timed during England's 4 0 victory over uh, Bulgaria. And Ollie Holt's column. Um, in the mail on Sunday. Uh, we'll separate the issues in taking on Fergie and Shearer. Keane and Owen uh, are fighting battles. They will never win. Uh, Roy Keane, particularly critical and vicious in an attack on uh, Sir Alex Ferguson um, in the week. Um, and uh, Michael Owen, I guess we could say the same about him and Alan Shearer. Two guys that you know very, very well, Matt. Um, what are your thoughts on, uh, on Owen spilling the beans, telling all coughing in his uh, new book? Well, I think as journalists, we're never going to be against uh, honesty, are we? <laughs> so, yep. um, and uh, yeah, even yeah, Twitter comes out of this world because it's um, it's it's shone a light on on a fascinating relationship, a fascinating dynamic. Um, I think uh, it's been festering for a long time. You know, did you know? It was, did you know it was festering? Not quite as person. I mean, they're certainly aware that there had been a shall we say, parting of the ways, but not quite as, as, as personal as this. I mean, it involves all sorts of... It involves goes back to when Michael was playing at Newcastle, obviously, and Shearer comes in, and they have a... and they're fighting for their lives, and Alan Shearer deems that Michael Owen has not given everything that he should have done for, for the Newcastle cause. It then spills over into, um, I understand, Michael Owen's stables. You know, Shearer did have horses there, then he didn't, you know, so it's got... There's, there's personal issues there, and it's all 
bubbled bubbled over um, certainly in a, in a fascinating way. I mean, it, it's, it involves so much, doesn't it? Because you know, it goes back to Michael Owen's career trajectory. A, a lot of this, which is how he ended up at Newcastle in the first place. Should he have ended up there? Obviously, he's, there's there's a sort of history behind that. I mean. It happens because he ends up at Real Madrid. Personally, I don't think I'd, we were doing columns at the time. I mean, I know he'll say yeah, he did score a lot of goals for Real Madrid. Who would? It's very hard to turn down going to Real Madrid. But he went there and was never going to settle. He didn't like, you know, he was a sort of home bird who didn't like being abroad. And he was stuck in a hotel. He had a young family at the time. I remember going well, over you, there. Well, you're not stuck. I've got to say, Matt, you're not stuck in a hotel. You well, OK, he, was, he made that decision himself. But he was not He was not someone who took to that lifestyle. You know, he was... Well, you know, that's, I'm not, that's, this your, gonna be that's the world's, your own fault. The world's smallest, you don't take to... No, 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 the world's smallest violin will be out from people around football, out, you know, as I say that. But I think he's there, then he wants to come back, and he suddenly doesn't have, you know, the options... He, he wanted want. to go to Liverpool. Back he to wanted Liverpool. to go back to Liverpool. Desperate to go back to Liverpool. And I mean, I think I wrote at the time when he um, when he ends up back at, at Newcastle, it was a sort of ambush more than it was a transfer in the sense that you know, it was that that desperation was seized upon by by Newcastle. And again, you know, yeah, he makes the decision. I mean, he's the one who signs on the. But it was fascinating to hear that he, he even has a sort of family conference to decide, advisors conference about you know, should he make the move or not. There was that much uncertainty, and it was like, well. Yeah, my family will be happier back in England. Um, so he, anyway, lurches back there, and then, as as he has been honest about, it was a move that never, mm. never lit his personal fires. He was getting his injury record had started by then, and he starts that that sort of decline um, as a player. But I think you know, if I'm talking overall, he's been candid about a lot of things. I mean, I think there was the chapter about um, Wayne Rooney. He's talking mm. about how that got into his head when Rooney burst in. You know. For someone who they've had the same representatives for a while, and they, there was a sort of deliberately bland, cultivated image, which he's been slightly honest about as well. He's sort of, I think, reflected with some regret that, you know, those two have always been actually behind the scenes quite spiky, hugely driven, obviously, much more interesting characters than they were allowed to be or they allowed themselves to be, because it was deemed at the time that sort of bland and squeaky clean would get you better endorsements it would get you more popularity and that was a sort of corporate decision made and i actually think they should both regret that because who wants to be bland and who wants to sort of have to live up to some image that isn't really true mm. but did you believe in the Owen image i always found it was manufactured and created as dicko just said yeah. that, that was very very clear if you worked in the game it was all we, every, but he wasn't alone. Knew, he, wasn't, he wasn't alone no, he in wasn't. that respect, was he? That was the thing to do at that time. And look, it obviously made him a lot of money. I think he he said he happily tells people that when he was at the peak of his career, he earned far more money off the pitch with various things than he did on it. Um, I applaud Owen. I mean, I'm probably in the lesser camp here, but if you want to if you if you if you buy a book you want to you want to, it's got to be good isn't it i mean last Owen's last book was was a poor seller so he's probably trying to make up for for that but look you, if you take on Shearer and say the things he said you're going to you're going to cop for some stick and i think the mis mistake Owen did in the week was um go on social media twitter and say basically i'm fed up of all this on twitter i'm getting a load of stick but he'd serialised the book. He'd agreed for the book to be serialised. You can't serialise the book before it's out and then say, I've had enough with all this grief. You've got to take the flack. I mean, but uh, it's a battle he's not going to win with Shearer because Shearer's a god on Tyneside, isn't he? We all know that. But I've got, I, I respect him for being honest and being far more interesting now than he ever was as a player or a pundit. I mean, I don't think he's a great pundit personally, but... At least he's had the balls to come out and say something, you know, that we all want to read and um, shine a new light on his character. I, I like Michael Owen. I worked with him a couple of years ago. And your question about did you believe the Michael Owen image, I must have taken it in because I was expecting something pretty bland and mm. um, not very interesting. And I was really surprised at how spiky he was, you know, there were depths, there was insight. And, and, and I think that should come out more in his punditry because I think it's all there. I think he has interesting ideas. And um, so I didn't know about the depth of this feud and I wasn't quite expecting this from his book, but I, I, 
part of it didn't surprise me because he, he showed, you know, in the, in the conversations we had, um, he was he was incredibly personable and always sort of it got, got back to you, which, as we know, is not always the case for every um, professional mm -hmm. footballer. And I wasn't expecting that. I thought you'd see a very single-minded, business-driven, cold relationship, and it wasn't that at all. Um, and I enjoyed um, what we did together. And I thought the most fascinating bit of this book was, as Matt alluded to, the Wayne Rooney, the psychological breakdown he had, which pretty much leads to his move to Real Madrid because he's went because of Wayne Rooney's emergence. And I thought that was incredibly honest for someone who I was just assumed was clinical, psychologically could block everything out. You know, in this age in which we obviously now try to encourage people to talk about stuff, you would imagine Michael would have been that sort of individual just kept things to himself but he was he was breaking down and i think that's obviously you know we we assumed it was his injuries that were slowing him down and making him less effective as he got older but i think you could attribute as much to his, his psychological breakdown and that that disappointment of not being the 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 star man anymore he eventually probably adjusted to it in those years at man united and and could be effective as a lesser player but that that's a real lesson and a journey that every footballer and everyone mm -hmm. in any career has to manage like there are ups and downs and as a footballer the downs can come quite i think it's 24 25 when he started the downward curve and that's tough to manage there's um you both worked with, with Owen. you both know him um well does he love the game does he love the sport um as much as horses um <laughs> yeah it's uh well, yeah I, I think he's he has again been honest enough to admit that once he started on the the downslope, as Rob says, he, he found it hard. I mean, there's no two, two ways about it. He was struggling to... When you've been the star, when you've been 18 and gone to a World Cup and, and, and you know, when you've won... You know, forget, he was European Football of the Year, yeah. you know, um, in 2001, I think it was. And he, you know, when you've hit those heights that young and then your body starts, you know, and pace was so absolutely key to his game, you know, and you remember certain games that he would just win on the, uh, the, the FA Cup final against Arsenal when he just, you know, that's, that becomes his match. And then suddenly you're not doing that and Rooney comes on the scene and he, yeah, I mean, he's been honest enough to say that those last five years of his career were super hard. I mean, it was, it was a battle and it wasn't a battle he always enjoyed. And I'm just, yeah, I think he did fall out of, of a, a degree of love with it for those reasons. But he was um, an effective foil to Rooney in 2004. He actually, and he, he was creating assists. I mean, he wasn't the star man. And if he could have adjusted to that, it's hard though, isn't it? But if he could adjust to Wayne being the, the star man, that might have been a partnership that, that could have been really good for him. I, I think he, uh, Matt said it, he loves horses. I think that that's my impression, his passion, that's like his that. passion. That's when his eyes light up. And he, that, that's what he loves. And, he, and, and, and then, what's wrong with that? Uh, yeah, but, and it's but, also, I mean, yeah, no, it's not, it's, it's, it's a weird thing to say, but you know, it's like some people, it's Gareth Bale. Some people say Gareth Bale loves, a lot of people say mm. Gareth Bale loves golf more than he loves football. I mean, it's a sort of, you think, how, how is that even possible? But, you know, it's almost like the, the football's a job. Yeah. But the golf's a passion. Anything, it's, yeah, exactly. But he's it's, fascinating. I mean, honestly, he has, he, he's, I know people will sort of talk about his country. He is genuinely fascinating on football. I think he has really good ideas. He knows it inside out. He thinks about it a lot. It's not that he's, you know, that's not to say he doesn't love football. He just, I think his, my impression was his real passion was his stay with his horses. You know, he's, he's, he, he, he loves all of that. He loves being at those stables. Mm. OK. Uh, we need to move on to another uh, spat, uh, which is uh, Keane v Fergie, uh, which resurfaced this week. Um, how do you feel about Keane's approach to his former manager. Ollie makes the point in his column this morning that the way uh, Keane talked about him, he said Keane made no concessions to Ferguson's age, uh, but I think more pertinently uh, to his recent health problems when he was asked about their relationship, he attacked the way the manager handled uh, Keane's exit from Old Trafford, including David Gill, who said he'd been mm. at Old Trafford for 11 and a half years when actually um, it was 12 and a half. I think the overriding feeling is it's just really sad, isn't it? I mean, Keane was one of the true greats of his generation, carried United through various campaigns, helped them win trophies. He was basically Fergie's lieutenant, wasn't he? And um, I mean, <laughs> the world's a more interesting place with Keane in it, but I just think <laughs> it's, that's not always for the right reasons. I mean, it's funny, really, because Keane, when he's very outspoken, as we know, and he can be brutally critical of people, and he strips them back. Um, when Owen's... Oh, see, he, a lot of people lionise him for that, don't they, and think, oh, he's a great pundit. Owen's done this in the book, and he's been absolutely hammered from all four sides of the globe, but... Um, 
I agree. I think that's exactly the point, isn't it? You know, Roy, Roy Keane is is celebrated, fated for for, for being unusually in football for being, you know, he dares to say things that that others others don't. But that doesn't mean to say we shouldn't challenge them. You know, just because you come out with a flamethrower and oh, everyone, you know, apparently the crowd were, you know, I mean, he is on home turf, but the crowd are roaring him on even when he's asked, you know, did you contact Ferguson when he had, you know, what seemed at the time potentially life-threatening. Mm. And um, he basically clearly hadn't, and the crowd cheer that, which you think that's not, mm. you know, it's, we should be questioning. It's the same, you know, when he was on, he was talking about Man United last, last year when he was being, being a pundit, and he sort of, again, got the flamethrower out, and everyone goes, oh, yeah, he's telling it like it is. But actually, you strip down his analysis, there were huge holes in it. So I think just because you are outspoken and you are, you know, doesn't mean to say that actually we, we shouldn't be willing to say some of it's nonsense. And, you know, certainly when it comes to the, 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 the split with Ferguson, you know, that meeting, he made it impossible for him to stay as a Man United manager. When you are, you know, absolutely ripping, you know, in front of the entire squad and the manager, you are taking the assistant manager at the time, Carlos Quiroz, and basically speaking to him in a way that is, you know, is asking for the sack, then what are you expecting? Hmm. I once got into a lift in, I think we were in Rimini. And yeah. then I, was, I was there with you. Southgate was there as well before he was in the He was manager. playing cricket with us on the beach, wasn't he? Yeah, Southgate so I, guess was, yeah. I, got, I, got, I was in the lift and it got to my floor and Roy Keane, after the doors opened, and Roy Keane was getting in and I was getting walking out. And, you know, as you do, I don't really know him, but I just, you give a nod and say hi. And he just, he basically, it was like I was invisible. He just looked straight through me. Walk past me, press the button, I got out and didn't even acknowledge my existence. But Not what? saying he should have done, but he's just, just a, he's a cold and brutal I individual. Said, I, I hope you called out his rudeness to his face. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, it's like, it's, yeah, it's like the story of Jonathan Walters when he said, uh, when Walters said, I'm going to come around, come around your house and sort things out, and he said, well, okay, and he wrote down mm. his address and said, well, I'll see you there soon. What was, I mean, he, he, he has this presence key, which was obviously part of which made him such a great player, but what made me chuckle in the week was at this roadshow in Dublin when Neville was um, sat alongside, was it? Was it was, yeah. 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 Okay. Neville, who is obviously a very confident and outspoken guy himself, looked absolutely petrified sat next to Keane. It's the only time you ever see Neville sort of look slightly uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, of course, I mean, he, he would have respect for Sir Alex Ferguson, though, right? I mean, yeah, he, I think, I think it's a guy who brought him through yeah, a match. It's an uncomfortable United. situation to see yeah. someone who you admire. Look, look, Ferguson clearly had faults. He clearly did something wrong. But if you're really weighing up the, the contribution of Sir Alex Ferguson through yeah. your, just through your own personal perspective... 13 you're, Premier League titles, like, come on. You know, and that, the, therefore... I mean, yeah, I, we can all point to lots of situations where Alex Ferguson did what was good for him rather than good for the club. But overall, on balance, did he too, like, make Manchester United a club they are? Yes, he did. So it's ridiculous. I think Roy Keane's analysis on Man United is... Cons I don't think it's spiky. I think it's conservative and old-fashioned. It always seems to boil down to, should be a bit more like me, there should be more passion. They get, you know, they, they have silly haircuts. and they're not, I mean, it's basically the analysis of the 1990s. And it, it's, mm. it's as though you're not embracing how the game has changed. Mm. He was brutal on Walters as well. Yeah, they don't get on, do they? Which is no. you've, also, you've, also, yeah, you've, you've got to have the self-awareness to admit you might have been wrong yourself, and that's the, that's, that seems yeah. to be what's like lacking. Like us. We're, we're, well, how, exactly, we're exactly, exactly. Exactly. Quality, that. What's that? exactly. <laughs> humility. Humility. Um, yeah. Known for it. But yeah. no, I think there's, you know, he's got a, you know, that, that the, sure. the, 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 um, the meeting, he's got, you know, I mean, if, I'd, if that should have been on tape, and then you can play that back and you say to Roy, you know, yeah. really? Mm. OK, well, look, let's hope one day that uh, Michael Owen and uh, Alan Shearer can pick up the phone to each other. And same for Roy Keane and Sir Alex Ferguson. There's so much history um, between those two well, respective parties. OK, next up, uh, well, we normally choose the agenda on the Sunday supper. We're going to have a first here, though. It's open mic season. The guests are going to choose the agenda. That's coming next. <laughs> Well, it's like Britain's Got Talent uh, on this programme this morning. In fact, it's a better version of that. Uh, it's open mic season. Uh, the guests, the boys, are going to choose a uh, subject to uh, wax lyrical about. And because Rob said he was going to rap his... Um, I, don't, I don't know why he said that. He did say at the start of the show he was going to... I thought, I thought, you know, that... No, no, well, let's... let's <laughs> who am I to stop you? Um, if we've got Dr Dre in I'll the house... I'll pass then, uh, that we should, it's OK. Yeah, OK, go Dr on. Draper. Yeah, <laughs> Dr Draper, <laughs> I love good. it. Um, his first album's coming up. What's on it? 
Um, well, I'm going to talk about gambling. We've written about it again today. You have. Um, just because um, we've been following a story about a company called One X Bet, um, who are global betting partners of Liverpool and Chelsea, and they were the African betting partners of of Tottenham and, and I first came across it I was visiting family in Kenya in April and, and if, you, if you go to Kenya the ads were still up in July you'll see massive adverts of Harry Kane beaming out of them saying come on bet with one X bet it's great and as the, as the sort of campaigners in Africa say obviously people like Harry Kane, Deli Ali who are on these big billboards they're massive sort of influencers of, of young people over there and Kenya has a massive problem with um, youth addiction to gambling and child addiction to gambling because they have a very digital currency um m pesa so you can bet very easily uh, and most people have access to that and and their license is suspended or has been suspended by the kenyan government because of these social issues so we drew attention to that the sunday times followed up with with some um uh, reports on their their british website the british based website which has led to the gambling commission and one expert agreeing to suspend their website and there's an investigation ongoing uh, and my question is 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 about the close relationship football has with gambling, which is far too close um, now, and, and how Liverpool and Chelsea can get themselves into a situation where now the Gambling Commission have written to them and say, well, actually, if you promote this betting company, which is your major betting partner, um, you're breaking the law. So they've had to remove all, all trace of it from their website. Um, Tottenham have taken the lead and actually have terminated the relationship. But... but did it, has it really come to the point at which if a gambling company just comes along and says, here's a much better deal than the last one you got, the clubs are willing to go, well, we'll sign up for that. Jurgen Klopp was advertising, um, was. Uh, I think it was Better Victor mm. last season. Um, you know, that, that's not appropriate. I don't think any, any football individual, I, I accept the need, they will, the need, I accept that they will have betting partners, but football individuals should not be <coughs> on billboards, in moving ads, that's now been banned, sort of encouraging people to bet. It's, it's a legal activity. If they want to have better partners, that's fine. But if they don't, this legislation is coming, and if they don't want it banned completely, they're going to have to start acting a lot more carefully, clubs. It, and it, it tells those clubs that when they are in, when they're in negotiations with potential co commercial partners, they really need to do a deep dive here. Well, I, I think for Tottenham, it's just the bad publicity, it's not worth it, is it? You know, you're getting... You're getting more stick than the benefit you're getting from the money. The the the, the stick in bad publicity is work is 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 has an overall effect a long time on your bottom line. Yeah, so you can't yeah. escape it though, can you? The get off like football and gambling go hand in glove. You've sat at home watching a football match, half time or half the adverts are for betting companies. You go to a football stadium, you see adverts galore. I mean, if we, a lot if of other we went back to, but Jeremy, you know what? If we went back to when we were kids growing up, and look, um, if. We, it was it was the pools, wasn't it? The football pool, football pools. I don't think you could gamble on an individual game at the time. I think it had to be triples. Well, obviously, I, don't, like, I don't really know, but I don't think you could bet on an individual no. game. The, the advent when, of the internet we kids. changed everything, didn't it? In terms of online, how easy it is to online. You can you can literally put a bet on what time a player is going to tie shoelaces these days. It's ridiculous. Mm. But other Perhaps sports, more, other sports have yeah. banned. Things like cigarette, I know we're going back a while now, but mm. things that were bad for you like alcohol, smoking, but gambling, obviously things that kill you, but gambling does kill people too. I mean, it's, it, it becomes a... When people are in the grip of it, An yeah. addiction that affects your health. Yeah, sure. OK, good stuff. Let's go round, round the table. Um, and uh, your subject, your, uh, your, oh, your penalties, aren't you? So my bugbear is, which has sort of been accentuated this season with Manchester United, is this, this situation where... It's penalties, basically. Who takes a penalty? Why does a club not have a specific penalty take? Like England, when England get a penalty, Kane, we referred to it earlier in the show, Kane takes the penalty. There's no question, there's no rowing. Rashford probably would have fancied taking that penalty last night, but he didn't even look at Kane. Kane just, he just accepted that Kane, and he's taking it, he'll score. But United, so picking on United, really, but um, there's been the issues with Pogba and Rashford. Um, both missing, sort of both debating what to do. Um, you said mention Marshall, maybe fancies taking penalties. I just think it's weak management that, from a Solskjaer, that he doesn't say, right, you're our best penalty taker, you're taking them until I say you're not. I mean, it's like when you watch a rugby game, Owen Farrell takes the kicks at goal. If he misses two or three, he doesn't get dropped from it. He, keep, he still takes the kicks, even if he misses a couple in the game, which doesn't happen very often. 
I just think it's poor. And it, to see players squabbling over it, it's just like, it's like looking into a school play. Particularly at Manchester United. Yeah. I just think it looks... It just reflects bad on the whole image of the club and what they should re represent. Like, and like Jeremy says, it should, this should be something that you can be absolutely scientific about. I mean, <laughs> and it, and most club We are used to that now, aren't we? The, the, you know, the they, know, they know the stats from training. They've got... Yeah, they log them. They... They all have their methodology of this is how we train them, and and it's it's something that you know most up to date coaches now are absolutely you know on top of this is our order, this is why it's our order, this is the circumstances, so that you do don't as you say ever end up in that situation. It, did, it does it does look amateur. City right? have had different penalty takers. Aguero has actually missed quite a few, but he 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 seems to be their number one penalty taker. But other players, De Bruyne's taken them, David Silva. Who's, who's the best penalty? Who is the best penalty taker in uh, history? Oh, history. I thought you were saying Kane. Absolute I tell you what, conviction this guy, I tell you was, this really guy good. will score. I never saw him miss one. Mario Balotelli, of all pet players. He never missed one for Man City. Never missed one. He That's, was so cool. Is that a fact? How many, how many does Ronaldo? You talked to Sarah. I don't, I don't know if it's a fact. How we're going to find Ronaldo, out in a second. Someone's going to tell me Ronaldo's now missed loads, but. I mean, Cristiano? Yeah. And I mean, there, seems to be, there needs to be some. What about Harry? There needs to be some adaptability, didn't there? Because no, I said you know, Harry. Letitia will be ringing in. Yeah. Messi's missed but a few penalties. Scored a, it's an art. Well, it's a and also, that's skill. why you do need some... Phil Neal. You need some... Phil Neal. I mean, Dennis Bergkamp. Dennis Bergkamp, one of the finest, you know, strikers mm. of a football... Controllers of a football. And mentally, he got to the point after that FA Cup semi-final, Schmeichel mm. save, where he couldn't take it anymore. And this is a guy who could pretty much do anything yeah. with a football. So, yeah, there does have to be an adaptability to the human aspect. But it, that is within understanding. Here's our one, two, three, yeah. four list. Mm. It's ECA 47 out of 48. And uh, Bergkamp, if you ever want to know how to be a professional footballer, I'm still working read. on the Balotelli step. I thought yeah, you said yeah. you're going to check. We're going to check. Still working on being a professional footballer. <laughs> was, yeah. If you want to know how to be a pro footballer, you've got to read Bergkamp's book, Stillness and Speed. Have you read it? The yeah, opening, I have the opening it. pages of that. Just don't, just don't take a penalty. Don't take penalties. Um, Matt, um, your specialist subject. Your uh, I wanted to celebrate. I'm sure everyone's aware that um, the women's uh, WSL started yesterday and yes. started with a bang. It was, you know, the record attendance um, before yesterday was five and something thousand, and yesterday it went up to over thirty thousand. Now, uh, you know, those aren't. And today, that was for Manchester City against Manchester United. Manchester United, United, United and today yeah. it will almost certainly be overtaken at, uh, at at Stamford Bridge with with Chelsea versus um, Spurs. So it's. You know, these are not insignificant numbers. Obviously, there's all the there's coming off the World Cup, um, but you know, I th and all of this, I just want to, you know, <laughs> people need to understand this growth from where women's football is coming from, which was basically actively suppressed for a long, a long time. You know, and the average attendance last season was only under a thousand. Actively suppressed. Well, yes, the, by FA, the FA, it was banned yeah. in the thirty, in the twenties. Oh, so, there, oh, sorry. Yeah, and, okay. And there are a lot of schools where, you, if you're a girl who, you know, at school level, if you want to play football, it's still not laid on for girls. So, you know, people can look at where it's at, which is growing, but also have to consider, you know, where it's going to go over not just ten years but fifty years. And you know, I'll even expand this to say that you know the men's game should be wanting to encourage it because who would you know at all levels just think about what we can gain from you know we've seen a few pioneer executives there's a few occasional doctors or physios but why shouldn't we be want you know why should you want to exclude 50% of the population who potentially have got all kinds of gifts and different perspectives that they could bring all kinds of roles and all kinds of levels into the men's game. So I, th I think there's all kinds of reasons to celebrate the growth of it, to encourage the growth of it, and to be patient and allow it to grow. Do you think we'd ever see prof a professional mixed side of men and women? I don't know. The football side is obviously more complicated for, you know, also, you know, and that's why there's also even been discussions about whether women should play on different size pitches and so on, you know, which yeah. I, I think is going to be resisted. But I certainly think, uh, you know, coach. Coaches wise, why not? I mean, why should, you know, gaining the, the, as the games get more professional, much more experience, you know, if you are capable of coaching women, why can you not coach men? I've got to say, what I, one of the things that I, I like about it is the, uh, is the environment. Um, I think it's more family friendly. Mm. And I know Premier League clubs and, and clubs in other divisions have done a lot um, to improve the behaviour of their, their supporters. But I have to say, the, the incessant language that you have to put up with at a Premier League game with, with supporters. Think of Arsenal last week, the, der the derby against Tottenham. And you've got a lot of Arsenal supporters there and it's, it's in your face for 90 minutes. It's relentless. Whereas at Women's Football Match, I think the environment 
is a complete a completely different experience. Yeah, and they've got a chance to build that mould that haven't they, and not not allow the toxic side of men's football to, to become part of it. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's they're taking the lead from Spain, aren't they? Where they've had they, marketing wise, they've had some massive. Um, attendances at Atletico Madrid, particularly mm. uh, Barcelona games, and, and it can, can be done. And um, well, I mean, my, my other sport was athletics, and so you always were competing men and women together. And I never watched Sally Gunn or Jess Ennis and went, oh, she's running a second slower than that. You, you didn't, you never assessed it in those terms, because that's an amazing time, you know. And, and so I've always found it odd that men watch women's football and go, oh, it's not quite as quick as the men's game, what well, are those other aspects to it? There's other things that are going on. I mean, of course, it's it's physically a different game, but it's equally as skillful and the merit is... Well, look up, is, anyone wants to just tune into the winner yesterday. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Belting yeah. 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 I've got a Michael Owen question for you after you just mentioned athletics. Is that is that your primary sport? <laughs> no. Not no, no. Oh, football through and Actually, through, I've always loved... No, I love football first. Kiss the badge, but not I was, kiss the badge I at this point. Athletics. Michael Owen would be upset. That, that was, I was better athletics than football. Yeah, That's you were. It. Was your marathon, marathon time? You've got to be sub three, right? No, no, it's not a sub three. I don't think it's... I beat Dickinson, though. That's the main thing. Right, I'm out, I'm out of retirement. <laughs> I, may, I, may, I may look 75, but I'm coming out of retirement. Yeah. Well, we, Sunday morning, that right? We wanted it. Henry Winter on this one, but he's doing the Great North Run. Yeah. What, what's, Henry, what's Henry going to um, sprint round he's in been, this morning? Uh, he's been in... He's what, been he he the looks effort, in good shape. Put, put what's, what, 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 go on, it. predict. What's he going to go round in? Great North Run. He'll be stopping for a few radio and TV interviews on the way around, though, won't he? So is he going to autograph? Is he going to swim the time like he did last time? That will slow him down. Yeah. He's got the Bristol Hall. I think he'll be Ollie Holt. I think Ollie Holt's doing it. Ollie Holt's doing it. Okay. Um, well, I hope they enjoy their day, the Great North Run in Bristol next week as well, or certainly Henry is. Okay. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about some of the home nations in uh, Euro 2020 action. Also, look forward uh, to England Kosovo. That's at St Mary's on uh, Tuesday night. More on that game coming next. Welcome back. Um, if you want to know what journalists talk about in the break here, they get very upset, they get very competitive. Um, they want to set the record straight about their, um, is it marathon times or half marathon times? I think we were talking head to head performances head and, and which I beat. Right, okay. But know, P there, which I think is what matters. Okay, I think, what, think year was, times what year was this? Is it 2015? All I just say is 3.13 PB, let's just put it on the table and walk away, I think. I think times are irrelevant. I think it's, it's what you do in competition. But Hogber and Rashford argue over Shearer, oh. Shearer Owen. <laughs> Mark two. Yeah, yeah, the, few, oh, the, few, the few that started. Yeah, come on, shake, shake hands. It was a, it was a fair, it was a fair fight. Can't shake, not on Oof. that. <laughs> See that? Um, okay, let's talk um, some of the other home nations. Um, where should we start? Uh, Northern Ireland, because they've had a, they've had a cracking start, haven't they? Um, absolutely amazing start um, to their campaign, of course, because they're in the same group as uh, as Germany and Holland. Yeah, I think they've won four out of four. The top yeah. of the group. They've played the so-called weaker teams and and polished them off well. He's, I mean, they continue to punch above the weight, don't they, when you look at the squad they've got and yeah. the pool of players they have to pick from. He's doing a remarkable job there. I think they play Germany at home tomorrow, they so that, that'll be the acid test probably. I mean, Germany... Beaten 4-2 by Holland. They're not a vintage German side at the current time, but you'd still fully expect them to, to win uh, tomorrow, but... Um, you, who do you, sorry, who, you expect who to win? I'd expect Germany to win. That right. would be a, a point would be a great, probably a great result for Northern Ireland. Mm. Northern Ireland had a great win against Germany in the 80s. Ian Stewart, fantastic goal from, from long range. Mm. I remember that. And, but I think that it's interesting they front-loaded the, the easy fixtures. Whether I, I'm guessing they maybe went for that. I don't know in the negotiations. Or but is it is mm -hmm. it just scheduled? In the bathroom. Be because um, it kind of gives you a chance, a little bit of a chance. If you could just nick a sensational result, it puts the latter stages under pressure, doesn't it? Got to and, play Holland... Home and away, and Germany, Germany away, yeah. so it's, they're obviously up against it. But Holland can qualify via a playoff, so would that come into the equation? I don't know. Say if Holland were to finish third, I don't know. Do, do we get the sense that Germany are coming to the end of their their cycle under uh, Joe Schimmler? I th well, I think we saw them. It's, it's yeah. there's the and I was reading another article. Um, from we were saying that Confederations Cup 2017 when they played the, the, the B team, wasn't it? They left yeah. all the superstars and they were great. played the B team and then wiped, wiped the floor with the opposition. That was in Russia. And it's not just you know, and it's not just been the fact of you know, results and the, but there's, there's been all kinds of internal turmoil as well, hasn't there? The whole the way the whole Meza Ozil yes. Meza Ozil yeah. thing was handled. It's been it's it's all. I mean, I'm surprised he's still you know his his record has been remarkable, but I'm I'm surprised he's 
you still there, I'd have thought they'd have, they would have freshened it up. And like then that. cutting out Müller yeah. and Burton as well, that yeah. didn't, wasn't handled very well, was it? I mean, he, to be fair, he's been there 10 years. I mean, he, it's, it probably is time for change. But he seems to be, and he seems to be lurched into sort of, I'm going to make this change just to make a point. And when you start doing that, that's for a manager that's always dangerous. Yeah. You know, you suddenly start, right, I'm going to, your career's finished because I need to show other people that I'm making changes. And that's, you know, very often you're cutting your nose off there because actually, you know, that happened with David Beckham mm -hmm. with, with Steve, Steve McLaren, McLaren, didn't he? He felt that there was a point need to be made about a new generation and then actually you suddenly find out that the next generation aren't working or so it's it's yeah, I'd write off the Germans at your peril, but I, you know, I think we're in we are in a better certainly shape in terms of the squad coming together, having a plan, having a strategy and sort of mm -hmm. knowing where we want to go. But coaching wise they've got a really rich legacy, so it's surprise you know, if they want to make a change, there's plenty of good coaches to choose from. Which but if they were going to make a change, surely it'd have been after Russia. Oh, yeah, it was absolutely. an absolute it should have been after Russia. It should have been so after Russia. The fact that he survived that makes you think, well, yeah. he's pretty bulletproof, this guy. Mm. Yeah, okay. He wouldn't well, win a World Cup. Did a good job in 2014. Yeah. A bit like Alan Ralph Ramsey right. stage, aren't they? I mean, yeah, if you win probably, a World Cup, but... it's hard to it's hard to tear up a yeah. team and, and a manager, isn't it? But, yeah. but that's, certainly... that's five years. I'd ago. take that decline if we win a World Cup or European Championship. I'll Scotland uh, keep tearing things up and starting again. Um, how, how do they reboot? To use one of the phrases of the uh, of the week. Well, they won their Nations League group, so they they've got the the potential of playoff. Although you know that's a semi and then a final, so that, that that's difficult. Um, I mean, they, they really sort of got killed early on, didn't they? Yeah. By, was it Azerbaijan? Didn't they lost yeah. to. Um, and um, I don't, I never properly understand why Scotland aren't punching higher, aren't punching more above their weight. I think there are some good individual players. I mean, the fact that they've got two of the best left backs in the world is is um, mm. is tricky because you know you want to play them both, but. Um, that, uh, and, I, and I suspect it comes down to the fact that Celtic and Rangers had a period of not worrying too much about developing players and buying foreign talent, and that probably um, harmed the development of, of Scottish players, which had been such a great breeding ground for, for great, great players. Um, they, they, they should be doing better. And if they look at Northern Ireland, Michael O'Neill was in for the Scotland job, wasn't he? Mm. And then they decided they, they didn't go down that route. But if they look at Northern Ireland, um, they, they clearly should be doing better. But they have got that escape route of, of a playoff, which they're going to have to rely on now. It did, yeah. We should say it did take us about five minutes to work out the qualifying yeah. sort of rows there, which is, I mean, the Nations League actually, you know, <coughs> what we saw with England was great, but the sort of the more complicated side of it is that, as you say, we're trying to work out what does Scotland come here in the group. Mm -hmm. That means they get this playoff, and who's that against? And it's um, it does feel like there's a lot of safety nets out there. Yeah. Um, they were booed off, weren't they, after losing to Russia, mm -hmm. and you felt for yeah. Clark's. I think he's a, he's a yeah. good manager. Yeah. But you, you just see the cycle just starting again, don't you? Mm -hmm. OK, so here's a quick word on uh, England and uh, Cosmo Tuesday night at uh, <coughs> St Mary's. What are we expecting, what do we anticipate, and will Southgate make any changes? Are there any obvious changes to this team? I think he'll change the full-backs. I think Rob was right when he, when he said that Trippier and Rose probably are number twos in the pecking order. Um, he's expecting... I don't think there'll be many changes, because he, 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 he knows he's in for a tough game. I mean, they're on the longest and beaten run in Europe, Kosovo, 15 games, so, you know, they clearly are formidable unit that we've got together there and um, I think the fact that it's at St Mary's will help Kosovo, smaller pitch, tighter ground, if it was at Wembley it wouldn't, it wouldn't play, it would play into England's hands more than theirs. So it might be a feisty game so he'll have to think up carefully about who he picks but I, I, it's not one for making rafts of changes Southgate so mm -hmm. there'll be some tweaks and changes but I don't expect six or seven changes. Will you change Winks for Rice, I wonder? I mean, I'm wondering mm -hmm. who is the first choice in that position, and I'm wondering who is first choice. Is it Sancho or Rashford? Uh, maybe it is Rashford, but you, you could argue that Rashford got this game and Sancho will come mm -hmm. in. For well, I assume it would be a horses. Game. I mean, there should be a horses for courses in that holding midfield position because, you know, mm -hmm. Rice is... The profile is just so different, isn't it? Mm -hmm. When you've got a certain game, and that's why I actually... Reflecting on yesterday, I thought that was. I would like to see him Winks play yesterday because of the domination of the ball. The fact is that we were parked on the on the halfway line. That's a game where I'd like to have seen Winks recycling the ball, seeing mm -hmm. how he would have interacted against another team that 
you know, you're more likely to be hit on the counter or something. Maybe it's a rice mat. <coughs> OK, well, we'll find out on Tuesday night, England uh, against Kosovo at St Mary's. We'll all be there. OK, we've run out of time. Thanks very much for your company this morning. Thanks to Matt, to Jeremy and to Rob. See you Tuesday night. OK, lots of football coming your way. It's uh, Armenia against Bosnia. Erza Govina. <laughs> Shall I say that again? Uh, at 1.55, Georgia against Denmark. Uh, 4.55, Spain against the Faroe Islands at 7.40. Uh, flick over for the Ashes. It's England against Australia. It's day five in the four tests. OK, don't forget you can download the podcast from all the usual places. Catch up with the show on demand. We'll see you next week at 10 o'clock. Bye for now. Sky Sports Premier League. Feel it all. 